Well, we began this season of Lent last week with Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is a day when we remember that we have come from dust, and to dust we will return. Now, if that sounds harsh, it's meant to sound harsh. In our tradition, we are asked on one day out of the entire liturgical year to remember that we are mortal beings. Our lives have a beginning and an ending. In our culture, in our society, and throughout history, we have become very good at celebrating the beginning of life and grieving at the end of life. But in the middle, we don't often consider how we might put shape and form around all that occurs in between. The gift of Lent is that it provides an opportunity to pause, to take a breath, to remember where we have come from, who we are, and where we are going. Like any gift that is offered, we can leave the gift sitting on the shelf unopened. We can look at that beautiful wrapping, we can dream about what the gift might actually be, or we can open the gift. Granted, it's a risk because it might be a gift we don't want, or it may be a gift we've been waiting for our entire life. Barbara Brown Taylor says the first time she read this story about Jacob in the Hebrew Bible, she knew it was true, whether it happened or not. There Jacob was, still a young man, running away from home because his whole screwy family had finally imploded. You think your families out there? Jacob would want to uh, talk to you about that. His was right up there. His father was dying. He and his twin brother Esau had both wanted their father's blessing. Jacob's mother had colluded with him to get it. And though his scheme worked, it enraged his brother to the point that Jacob had to flee for his life. Now, Jacob and Esau were twins, but apparently they weren't identical twins. Esau was the hunter. Jacob liked to eat. Esau was big and hairy, Jacob was smaller and smart. And because he was smart, Jacob knew that Esau could have squashed him like a bug. So Jacob left with little more than the clothes on his back, and when he had walked as far as he could, he looked around for a stone to use for a pillow. When he found the right size, Jacob lay down to sleep turning his cheek against the stone that was still warm from the sun. Taylor says maybe that dream was in the stone, or maybe that stone fell from the sky. Wherever the dream came from, it was vivid. A ladder set upon the earth with the top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God ascending and descending it, she says, like bright-winged ants. And then all of a sudden, God was there beside Jacob without a single trumpet for warning. God was there promising Jacob safety and children and land. Remember, I am with you, God said to Jacob. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Jacob woke from that dream with God's breath still stirring in the air, although he saw nothing out of the ordinary around him. It was the same wilderness, the same rocks, the same sand. If someone had held a mirror in front of Jacob's face, Jacob would not have seen anything different there except for the circles of surprise in his eyes. Truly, God is in this place, Jacob said out loud, and I did not know it. Shaken by what he'd seen, Jacob could not seem to stop talking. How awesome is this place? This is nothing less than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. It was one of those dreams, Taylor says, that Jacob could not have made up. 
It was one of those dreams that is so much more than real, so much more than what ordinarily passes for real. It was one of those dreams that trying to figure out what really happened here involves a complete redefinition of terms. What is really real? How do you know it's real? Can you prove it's real? Even if Jacob could never find the exact place where the feet of that heavenly ladder came to earth, even if he could never find a single angel footprint in the sand, his life was changed forever. Having woken up to God, he would never be able to go to sleep again. At least not asleep to the divine presence that had promised to be with him, whether he could see it or not. One of the reasons I love this story so much is that in the midst of Jacob's mess, God showed up. Even when Jacob didn't see it coming, God was there. Even when his life was in shambles, even when he was exhausted, God was there. You and I can't stop the challenges that keep, that life keeps throwing at us. You lose your job, your partner leaves, your child gets cancer, you lose your home in a fire, you get hit crossing the street. Or you've been accepted into a PhD program that will allow you to flourish. You get the job you've waited your whole life for. You find the perfect apartment or house. You've beaten your rivals, you're number one, you're at the top of your game, and you're still wonderful and nice. You retire, and suddenly you have time to do all the things you've wanted to do. No matter if the challenges are hard or unbelievably astonishing, when life changes, when we didn't see it coming, it can be like quicksand. We can be frozen in space and time. And we can either go to our defaults of thinking, feeling, or doing so quickly and so completely that it's impossible for us to step back and look for God. Throughout the narrative of the Bible, God keeps showing up. No matter where we are or what has happened, God sends us messengers that tell us not to be afraid. God sends us angels to help us find our way forward. God sends us manna, bread in the desert, the fuel that we need to keep going. Yet we often miss it because we are too busy trying to figure out what really happened. I wonder what it would be like, though, when we are in the middle of what we didn't see happening. To wake up and look for where God is in the midst of this challenge. This morning, when I came in from the parking garage, the signs that we use for directions were all together in one place. There was one sign that said, Seekers class this way. But then there was another sign pointing in the opposite direction, and another sign pointing in the opposite direction, and another sign pointing in the opposite direction. And I thought, wow, that's the sermon in one clip. I'm really sorry I didn't take a picture before they moved that. You know, when we are in the middle and these directional signs are all mixed up, life gets real. Because in these times, we have decisions to make. We have people to help and children to calm and tables to be set. Living small is not going to cut it. We have to step up and we step up all alone. Or we wake up and see that God is, in fact, all around us. In these next 40 days, we can travel alone, or we can travel together. My mother told me 
it's always safer to travel with others. I pray that Lent this year will be a time of new openings for each of us into our wild and precious lives, as Mary Oliver said. Even though we may be weary, I hope we will allow the Spirit to find us in the dust of the earth. I hope we will begin to believe that we are not just any old dust, but we truly are stardust. I hope we will remember we have galaxies of possibilities living in our flesh and bones. As we enter the wilderness of this season together, may what needs to die in our lives die, so that what needs to live can live. In these days, may we seek and may we find, may we shed and leave, so that in this season of reckoning, we will come to know how deeply, how fully, how passionately we are called to live and to love. Today, as we share the Eucharist in a few moments, I hope you will come to the table knowing you are not alone. I hope as you come, you will allow yourself to breathe in the stardust that surrounds us when we are all together. And I hope that you will allow that gift, that gift from God, to cleanse us and to heal us. Amen.